Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us tonight for this, uh, for this important anti-hate town hall. Uh, we deeply appreciate the time that you're taking to join us for this extremely important event. I'd like to start off by introducing myself and providing uh, a land acknowledgement. I'm Peter Julian, Member of Parliament for New Westminster Burnaby, and I am speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Kakite First Nation and the Coast Salish peoples on which land, uh, uh, unceded territory, traditional territory, we live, work, learn, and play. And given the hatred that has so often been directed towards Indigenous peoples and the genocide that we are still uncovering at these so-called residential schools, it's important more than ever to acknowledge the Indigenous territory and title. If you're not sure uh, which territory you live on, you can check out native-land.ca uh, to find out. And we certainly encourage you in the chat box now, if you could do a land acknowledgement from the territory that you're speaking from, we would uh, deeply appreciate that. I'd like to invite you tonight to, uh, to turn your camera on so we can see people at this important rally, just like we're in the streets uh, together. And, and please note that we'll be taking uh, the uh, a picture during this event. If you don't feel comfortable about being on camera, of course, uh, you can stop the video. Uh, we are doing this event in English, but we'll be doing a similar event uh, coming in, uh, in the coming weeks in French as well. And certainly stay tuned if you're interested in learning more about that. Uh, we do not have sign language interpretation, but there is closed captioning at this Zoom event. You can look at the bottom of your screen and you will see the word more, and you can click uh, show subtitles. So for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, uh, those people can uh, see the subtitles in that way. And please put the setting on as speaker view. You can choose that setting on the top right-hand view on view and choose speaker view on the top right-hand corner. If you have any questions at all or technical difficulties during this event, feel free to email, email us at peter.julian.c1 at parl.gc.ca. That's peter.julian.c1 at parl.gc.ca. In the next hour, we're going to hear from a number of distinguished speakers, and there will be time later on to have a question and answer period we will also be asking you an important uh, personal question in, in the coming, uh, coming half an hour to 45 minutes. And depending on the number of questions, we may extend uh, for a full hour. Now, the reason why we are holding this important town hall, and uh, we're surprised by, uh, we were anticipating having 100 people. We're now up to, to 200. That's extraordinary. Thank you so much for your participation. But why are we here? We've here, we're here because we have seen in this country and in across North America, a 40% increase in hate. According to the police figures, hate crimes are up by 40% over the last few years. We have seen an increase in all toxic forms of hate, racism and misogyny, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, homophobia and transphobia. And we have seen at uh, the outbreak of violence that includes killings in number of Canadian and American cities. Quebec, London, Ontario, El Paso, Pittsburgh are all examples of that increase in hate that we are seeing. And as the Washington Post has noted, over 80% of this violence comes from far right extremists. We need to stop this rise in hate and push back against hate. So tonight we'll talk a bit about some of what the NDP is putting forward to combat this rise in hate. We have compelling speakers and we will have an opportunity to, to discuss and push back against this rising tide that concerns so many of us. Now, part of what the NDP is offering, uh, many of you have, have heard about, and that's Bill C-229 would ban the use of symbols of hate, including the Nazi hooked cross and Nazi emblems, the Confederate flag and Ku Klux Klan uh, paraphernalia. 
Washington Post notes that the Ku Klux Klan continues to be active in the hate crimes that we are seeing in North America. And we saw just a few weeks ago, as part of the so-called Freedom Convoy, the Nazi hooked cross waving on Parliament Hill, a symbol of genocidal violence. This flag was unveiled just a few feet from the Hall of Honor that is on Parliament Hill and that pays tribute to the tens of thousands of Canadians who gave their lives fighting Nazism. We are putting forward this legislation in an effort, uh, as other countries have done, to ban these symbols of hate so that they can no longer be freely displayed. And I can tell you, in, in my community of New Westminster, uh, there was a store openly selling Nazi flags and emblems. The city could do nothing about it. And until such time as we amend the criminal code, uh, we will continue to see the sale and display of these symbols of hate in our country. Bill C-229 is one aspect of this pushback against the increasing hate that we are seeing. But there are other uh, pieces to putting forward the, the tools that we need to find solutions. Motion 14 that the NDP has tabled also talks about uh, putting in place a, an anti-racism strategy. That includes working with provinces and territories to ensure accurate tracking of hate crimes and incidences of hate, launching a robust public education campaign across Canada, ensuring that comprehensive victim services are available to all of those who are victims of hate crime or hate incidences, working to eliminate harmful images and stereotypes present in media and cinema, strengthening all leg legislation against hate and introducing amendments to the Canadian Human Rights Act to ensure that hate speech no longer occurs with impunity and ensuring that all federal government agencies and institutions consider the prevention of discrimination and the promotion of diversity as guiding principles of their work. Motion 14, coupled with C-229, uh, helps to provide additional tools for the federal government. And there is a final piece uh, that we are currently engaged in working on. And that is uh, modeled on the, the legislation that Senator Ed Markey has brought forward in the United States around transparency and algorithms. Uh, we're seeing as part of this increase in far right radicalization and this increase in hate that often algorithms play a role. It is essential in a democratic society that we know how these algorithms are put in place by social media companies. And this is uh, something that coalitions such as the Stop Hate for Profit Coalition in the United States has undertaken to find that transparency so that we can, in a very real sense, put in place the tools that are needed to fight back against hate. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And I am absolutely uh, pleased and, and honored to introduce our first speaker. He is my, my brother. Uh, the Member of Parliament for Burnaby South and the national leader of the NDP and has played an extraordinarily important leadership role in the House of Commons in battling back against hate in all its toxic forms. Please welcome the national leader of the NDP, Mr. Jagmeet Singh. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, really excited to be here with you to talk about something that's really important to me and I think to so many Canadians. If you all could do me a quick favor though, and embarrass Peter with me, you could go to your, I don't know if we have those activated, we do. If you can go to your um, emoticons and put up a heart for Peter's birthday that just passed within a week ago. So I just going up in the corner there. So feel free to do a little heart, send some love to Peter who is my dear brother and good friend. Uh, I see lots of folks are already doing it. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it, Peter. Uh, that's for you, brother. Um, so we, we are talking about something really important, and I just want to lay out a couple of things about why this conversation is so important. Before we open it up to the public, we were chatting a bit with some of our presenters today, and I'll shout them out. Uh, Barbara, uh, where's the rest of the folks there? Oh, there is Bernie and Bandit uh, Rupnath Sharma, who, who are, will be sharing with you some thoughts. Uh, and one of the things that came up was that while we're really concerned, as Peter mentioned, about the rise of hate, it is it is real. I'm hearing so many stories from people in my constituency in Burnaby, in Burnaby South, from people in communities that I visit often, like the GTA, Vancouver, Montreal, 
uh, that this is really across the country we're seeing a rise in hate and it's meaning uh, more violence, more intimidation. And, and in some cases, we've seen the horrible outcomes of hate, which are people losing their lives. So we, we know that this is happening, but we also can get hope in the fact that it's really not the majority of people. There, there are very vocal, very loud and vocal and dangerous group of people, particularly from the extreme right that are flaming these flames, these flames of, of hatred. But we can take some hope in the fact that most Canadians aren't of that, of that way of thinking. But the danger is, in many of the cases of some of the worst hate, it was online uh, hate that radicalized people into because of misinformation, because of wrongly putting all the blame on different communities, they became the target of, of the anger and frustration that people feel. And so that's really important for us to acknowledge. So stopping that hate is so important. The other thing about hate is hate is like a fire. And I've always referred to it this way, because once it takes hold, it spreads. It will not stay focused on someone because of their religion or their gender. It'll expand and include people based on the the way they look, the color of their skin, the country of origin, the language they speak. So once hate is allowed to take hold, it will spread. And so we have a collective responsibility, I feel like all of us have a responsibility to stamp out the flames of hate wherever they raise, wherever hate rear, rear, rears its head. And that's why this bill is so important. I'm really uh, honored that, that Peter put forward this bill because it's about stamping out some of the that hate, giving it no space to breathe, giving it no oxygen to breathe, giving it no space to take hold. And it's really important that we do that because we've seen hate emboldened recently. It's been encouraged. People have come out of the woodworks who might have been afraid to express their thoughts have now felt like it's okay for them to have bigoted or hateful um, beliefs and to express those beliefs. They've been emboldened. So we need to take away that space and that permission which we, we feel never should have been ever considered to be there, but but people have been emboldened and we need to take away that space for that type of hate to be there. And the other reason why I think about, about hate so much and, and why we need to make sure people feel like they belong is because it's not the, just the violence, it's not just the, the horrible threat of, of death, which is the end cause of extreme hate. It's also that sense of people not feeling like they belong. And when people don't feel like they belong, they're unable to participate, to give them themselves, to contribute back into society. And we're all weaker and poorer from that. So I think it's so important to make sure, sure people feel like they belong. And the final thing, I've always stood against hate and I've experienced it personally. And I think it's so important for us to stand together. I also have a new kind of motivation to care about hate. And when I think about my daughter and the type of world I want her to grow up in, we named uh, our daughter Anhad. And a short definition of Anhad is limitless. And we want her to be limitless. We want her to feel like she's got no limits. So anytime we say her name and she hears her name or says her name, she, she, I hope she thinks of herself as limitless. And what I want for, for my daughter is what I want for all kids. I want every kid to grow up in a country where they feel like they belong and they don't feel limited. And, the, and hate is very limiting. It makes people feel smaller. It makes people feel less than. And it makes people feel limited. And so for my daughter and for all daughters and for all kids and for all people, let's commit to building a Canada where people feel like they belong and they're celebrated and they have self-worth. And this work to, to take away any space for hate, I think, is a powerful way for us to come together and make that bold declaration that we are going to build a world where everyone belongs, where no one is singled out for who they are. And in fact, people are celebrated for who they are instead of being hated for who they are. So I'm really excited to be here and looking forward to hearing from the speakers. And I thank Peter for organizing this as well as putting together the bill. Hey, thank you so much, Jagmeet, and thank you for your powerful words and for your leadership in the House of Commons. Um, we are going to ask um, folks if uh, they're willing to, to print off uh, some of what was sent out, uh, the Stop Hate uh, Bill C-229. If you can take a moment now and, uh, and uh, put, your, put your screen on and lift it up. This is part of an online rally. And so uh, we'd like you to uh, hold this up if you could. And we're just gonna take a couple of quick uh, pictures as well. I think it's so cool to see, Peter, that so many people have the Stop Hate sign. And I think it's great for us to do a picture. If you can put your view onto to group view where you can see everybody, I think it's really powerful. You can scroll through and see how many people have the image up and how many people are on this call. It's so exciting. 
Thanks very much, Jagmeet. And yes, we were uh, we were expecting about uh, uh, half half the number of what we've uh, actually had so far at over 212 people. Uh, thank you for holding this up. I'm just waiting to get a confirmation that everything's good. Okay, thank you so much. And I'm uh, just going to shift back now to speaker. Thanks, thanks to everybody. Uh, thank you again, Jagmeet. And I would like to introduce our next spe speaker, uh, Dr. Barbara Perry. And Dr. Dr. Perry is a professor in the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at Ontario Tech University and the director of the Center on Hate, Bias, and Extremism. She's written extensively in the field of hate studies. She's currently working in the areas of anti-Muslim violence, anti-Semitic hate crime, the community impacts of hate crime, and right-wing extremism in Canada. She's regularly called upon by policymakers, practitioners, and local, national, and international media as an expert on hate crime and right-wing extremism. Please welcome Dr. Barbara Perry. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Jagmeet, for the opportunity to speak tonight to this uh, important issue. Um, Bernie and I were talking beforehand about how uh, this is sort of an unprecedented era for us uh, in terms of the depth and the breadth and the intensity of the hate that we're seeing. When we think about the far right, uh, in particular, that movement, uh, we've seen dramatic growth in the last five or six years alone. Um, in 2015, we pub uh, tw sorry, 2018, we published a study where we identified uh, about 100 active groups. And in the last couple of years alone, we've identified closer to, or actually I should say over uh, 300 active far right groups in the Canadian context, not to mention the thousands of people, uh, individuals who come to the movement without necessarily joining a particular group. Um, I think it's also important to note that these groups are very diverse in terms of how they represent themselves, in terms of their narratives. Um, we have to think of the far right movement as a subculture, I think, and you know the individual groups and entities as even uh, you know a subset of that. But with subcultures, of course, come you know their, their particular language. Um, you know, their memes, their tropes, as we've come, become used to talking about them online, their uniforms, and of course, the symbols uh, that they use to represent themselves and that they use as a core for their collective identities. So the symbols that we're talking about here uh, that are really at the heart of the, the legislation you're putting forward, um, you know, first and foremost, the audience that they're intended to uh, address are like-minded others. So they become a badge of honor, a badge of uh, membership in a particular community, in this case, a racist or xenophobic uh, and or transphobic and or anti-Indigenous and or the list goes on. Um, you know, the, the, that is their community. That is their, their shared identity. Uh, and those symbols are one way, one thing, if you will, that they can, they can gather around, rally around uh, to identify themselves. But I think at top of mind, we really need to have uh, sort of the other audience in mind, and that is who's impacted uh, by the groups themselves, but also even by the symbols, because we do see them, uh, you know, waving proudly or, you know, emblazoned on hats or on t-shirts or on the backs of, uh, of hoodies. Uh, and that, uh, those are the communities that they're intended to silence. I mean, many of these symbols that we're so familiar with now have long historical lineages. Uh, and we're very much aware of what the, what the meaning is of the Confederate flag, of the swastika as it's used by the neo-Nazis, uh, for example, other symbols as well. Uh, and they are intended to remind people that they're not valued, that they're not welcome, uh, to disrupt that sense of belonging that Jagmeet uh, spoke about at the outset. Uh, so they really are, are damaging, right? This is not just, they're not just offensive. They don't just hurt someone's feelings. They are damaging. They disrupt people's sense of place and being uh, as part of our community. Uh, and so I think that it's important to acknowledge that, acknowledge the pain uh, that's associated with that. I think the last thing I would say is, yeah, we're familiar with the Confederate flag. We're familiar with some of these other ones. I think what we also have to keep in mind and what we need to attend to going forward uh, is, is the notion that these groups morph regularly. They shift their identities as they become identified and you know they're sort of no longer under the radar. We're paying close attention to them. It's too hot for them. They shift their identities. And with that, they often shift 
those symbols that they use to represent themselves. And so we have to be attentive to that. We have to be sort of constantly monitoring uh, the uh, the movement to see what kinds of, of symbols they're they're pulling in. And often they do hark back to Nazi symbology, sometimes to paganism, sometimes to uh, to Odinism. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a long journey that we have ahead of our, ourselves. And I think that it goes very much in line with uh, the other initiative that you have ongoing. And, and uh, you know, that there's lots of conversations about national action plans around racism, national action plans around hate. This is the kind of work uh, that those kinds of initiatives really need to, uh, to put their minds to. Uh, so again, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to say a few words and very much looking forward to a bit more of a discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferry, and thank you for your uh, amazing and significant work as, as well. And uh, look forward to the conversation and the questions that we're going to have shortly. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, somebody who has uh, made a big difference in our community and our country as well, and that is Pandit Rupnath Sharma. He's a spiritual leader and a practicing Hindu priest at Ram Madir in Mississauga, which is a community of over 5,000 families. Prior to retirement, Pandit Sharma was employed in the corporate business world, engaged in senior management at PricewaterhouseCooper, Oracle, and Ernst & Young. He is currently president of the Hindu Federation of Canada and president of the Canadian Multi-Faith Federation, which is an umbrella body representing over 30 faith groups. He is a president and Hindu chaplain for Interfaith in support of spiritual care services at Correctional Services Canada and is a member of the G20 Interfaith Association Advisory Council. Please welcome Pandit Rupnath Sharma. Namaste, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this discussion today. I must say that I'm new to this type of discussions because I tend to preach about being peaceful and understanding and forgiving. And here we are talking, how do we combat hate? The realities are that since the beginning of human existence, this human emotion has always been there and it will never be eradicated. It can be controlled. And we are talking about the control mechanisms right now. I want to talk about Peter Julian's story about someone selling on a street corner, having a shop. They were selling these flags and these signs. <clears throat> and the person who was in business, was in business because people, there's a marketplace. So we banned the signs, the marketplace didn't go away. There is an under the table marketplace now. <clears throat> and they're finding another way to sell it like we did the drugs and marijuana and all of that over the ages. So I'm thinking that our approach has to be, yes, we must put laws in place to protect and to ensure that it is not perpetuated without any kind of uh, recourse. But we need to start looking how do we change the mindset of our society. And if we look at Canadian society, where do we start? We need to start at the early ages from the age of one to 12. When we educate our children for what they see on television, what they see in movies, what happens in our school, what is written in the books that they read, what is around them in the social media, and which is abundant. A child of six years old can pick up a cell phone or an iPad and can be on the world and see everything they shouldn't be seeing. And as such, we need to control that. And the media is the greatest weapon that we have in our hands and it's the greatest tool to educate. So the talk about what's happening with the media, it is the greatest toy that everyone has, especially the far right, to use a powerful tool to spread their, their form of what you will call their scripture and their belief systems. And it's influencing even the minds of the innocent who doesn't know what they're influencing to. It's like they're buying something, they don't know what it is, but because everybody's talking about it, it's popular, we're gonna get involved. So I think we need to look at the bigger picture and how do we address this not by throwing dollars at it, not by creating more police forces, but by educating at the ground level from base one. And why I'm saying from one to 12, that is where parents have the greatest opportunity to educate their children. And I know when our children reach 13, parents have to make an appointment to see them because they're very busy and they're so caught up with social media, they don't have time to listen to anything. So we need to, in somehow or the other, infuse in our education, education system this this whole philosophy of love each other, see each other as equal, understand and appreciate each one for their belief system, disregard their caste, color, and creed, and see them as a friend, a human being, a brother, a sister, a mother, a father that is equal to us at all times. And the more we promote this, this is the only way we can combat hate. 
And I really appreciate what Peter is doing. I think it's a step in the right direction. I think what all the members of government are doing to, to, to confront hate in any form must continue, but we need to start at the base. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pandit Sharma. Thank you for uh, your work in encountering uh, hate in all of its forms in this country. And uh, we appreciate your presence here this evening. Uh, I now have a question for all of you that are here. Uh, and this is a question that we would like you to answer through, uh, through polling. And uh, it'll come up on the screen shortly. But the question is the following. Have you personally experienced or have you witnessed incidences of hate directed towards people in your community? Again, the question is, have you personally experienced or have you witnessed incidences of hate directed towards people in your community? Uh, sometimes we hear that uh, it's, it's only some communities that are touched by this. Uh, we want to get a sense from all of you uh, on how, how in your community, uh, you see the, the situation. Has there been a rise in hate in your community? Now, to uh, answer the question, I think it will come up uh, shortly. Um, the, uh, just looking at our technical support, uh, the, the, you, uh, there the, the question is right there. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so have you personally experienced or have you witnessed incidents of hate directed towards people in your community. And uh, we have people logging on right now. Thank you very much for answering that question. Um, uh, and we will come back to this uh, poll result after our next speaker. And so I will ask that uh, we uh, get the results once uh, we, we, we now have the, um, We now have people logging on. Uh, so far, 76%, and this is a sad uh, commentary, 76% uh, of people have personally experienced or witnessed incidences of hate directing towards people in your community. Thank you very much for giving us that uh, sobering statistic that this is um, um, widespread at 76%. Uh, we do have members of the media that have logged on uh, as part of this. Uh, town hall. And certainly this is, uh, I think, a sobering statistic that all of us uh, should uh, be reflecting on at this critical time in our country's history. I'm, I'm now going on to our last speaker before we open things up uh, for, for questions. And, and that is uh, um, uh, somebody I admire a lot, uh, Bernie Farber. Bernie Farber is the chair of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, a vital institution at this time in our country. He's acknowledged as one of Canada's most accomplished uh, NGO CEOs, and his career spans NGOs or non-governmental organizations focused on human rights, diversity, anti-racism, and extremism. His efforts have been documented in numerous Canadian human rights publications, books, newspapers, and magazines, and his work has also been cited for its expertise in a number of academic publications. Mr. Farber is a human rights consultant, newspaper columnist, and social justice advocate. Please welcome Bernie Farber. Peter, thank you very much. And to my uh, uh, colleagues uh, who spoke before me, uh, Pandit Sharma and, and Barb, um, thank you for, for your words. We live in an increasingly difficult world. Um, sadly, I go back um, almost three and a half decades when it comes to dealing with hate. And um, it was simpler back then. If people wanted to get their messages of hate out, um, the neo-Nazis and the white supremacists stood on a cold and blistery street corner, be it in Toronto or Ottawa or Halifax or Vancouver or Winnipeg, and they would hand out uh, their leaflets. And if five people happened to take their leaflets, that was considered a pretty good day. Uh, today, with the advent of social media, we are in an entirely different world. I'm not even going to talk about the, uh, the issues of QAnon and conspiracy theories. I'm just going to talk about the haters. Because today, instead of handing out leaflets, they can go onto their laptops, they can type in and uh, key in whatever they wish, 
they can go on to a number of, uh, of, of different uh, websites from, yes, Facebook to Twitter to Telegram, uh, you name it, uh, they are there and they could potentially reach not five or 10 people, not hundreds, not even thousands, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. So ask yourself this, if they can reach 100,000 people in the flick of a key, and let us say 80% of those people pay absolutely no attention to that message. But let us say that, I don't know, 10,000 people pay attention to the message. And of that 10,000, let's say, oh, maybe 1,000 begin to identify with it. And of that 1,000, you have a couple of hundred who are actually shaking their head vigorously at the hate that's emanating. And out of the couple of 100, there may be uh, a few dozen that are active, that were prepared to go in the streets. And out of a few dozen, there may be, what, four or five who are actually willing to take it that one step further. There might be an, uh, an Alexandre Bissonnette uh, who walked into a uh, mosque in Quebec City in 2017 and murdered uh, six uh, Canadian Muslims at prayer. Uh, there might be a, uh, uh, another person whose name I don't want to even mention who, who murdered a uh, a Muslim caretaker outside of his own mosque, uh, Aslim Zafis. Um, and there, there may be a, uh, another individual similar to the one who walked into a Pittsburgh synagogue uh, and murdered 11 Jews peacefully at prayer. That's what the potential is today. You know, when you took the poll that Peter just uh, put out here before I spoke, and uh, I'm, I'm hearing sad numbers of 76% of you having experienced or seen a racist or bigoted incident, I'm not surprised. Um, uh, in this day and age, we not only have to confront racism, but we actually have to confront violent racism. Um, and that, that is extremely scary. And that is why I'm, I'm actually proud of those politicians, people like, uh, like Peter and Jagmeet and, and members of other parties who are standing together really shoulder to shoulder uh, and looking for ways to deal with this. Um, and yes, uh, you know, when, when, when Pandit Sharma said that education is a key, well, of course it's a key. And, and it's something that we haven't worked hard enough on. But let me point out something. I think this will be kind of interesting for you folks. Um, did you know that there's actually a bona fide uh, political party here, which is a Canadian Nazi party? Uh, their actual platform is to, you know, get rid of the Jews and people of color and, and, and other minorities. Um, it, it has, uh, it, it applied to Elections Canada and it, it, if you wanted to donate, please God, you wouldn't, $25 to this party or $100 to this party as you might to the Conservatives or the Liberals or the NDP, um, you will get a tax credit. Yep, that's right, you will get a tax credit. So we have a Canadian Nazi party here that's a bona fide uh, electoral party who, by the way, uh, you know, once there is an election, have access to all the voters lists. They know where I live, they know where you live, they have uh, all kinds of information about us as a result of having that access to that voters list by getting, a, uh, I don't even know if it was 25 names on a, on a list, paying a couple hundred dollars and boom, they are uh, a bona fide uh, political party. This, my friends, is a dangerous time. Uh, one of the individuals who's involved uh, with, with a number of different neo-Nazi organizations, and I'm going to end here because I, I I think it's more important that we engage in, in, in discussion, but I just, let me tell you a little bit about Kevin Goudreau. Uh, and you know, Barbara's nodding her head. She knows exactly who Kevin Goudreau is. He is a neo-Nazi who lives in Peterborough, Ontario. Uh, he's got a history of violence. He's got a history of out and out racism. Um, and he has, uh, we've had to seek a, uh, a restraining order against him because of the threats that he's made to myself and others of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. And just a short while ago, um, in, the, in, in the small apartment building that he was living, on the top floor were, were, were a lesbian couple, and uh, he came outside and started screaming up and down the street. I'm going to read some of this to you. It's a little triggering, but I think it's important to hear the triggers. Uh, one of the, the women actually had a tape, you know, had a, a, a handheld recorder and actually taped him screaming outside of his street. Imagine, remember that this is a man with a violent history saying, you're dead, you effing so-and-sos. I'll kick your effing teeth in, just wait. 
Just wait, Sieg Heil, white power, Sieg Heil, white power. Let's effing have a chat. Kick your effing teeth and I'll rip your face off. Heil Hitler, I'm going to kill you, trust you, wait. And this went on for 15 full minutes. It was reported to the Peterborough police and the Peterborough, Peterborough police actually attended. They, they said in their report, they calmed him down and that was the end of it. No charges laid whatsoever. That may change shortly because of some of the work that we're doing. This is the type of thing that we're facing daily. If you're a person of color, if, you're, uh, if you have a different sexual orientation, if you're Jewish, um, if you're trans, these things are faced on a daily basis, not just by the extremists out there, but those that even are less extreme, but still hold hatred in their hearts. And so we have a lot of work to do. This is the beginning. The bills and legislation that Peter and others have put forward uh, that are supported by the NDP and by the liberals, I think are hugely important. I'm hoping that other parties, the Conservative Party and other members get on board. This is not a partisan issue, my friends. It's got nothing really to do with politics. It's got to do with confronting hatred. And there should not be one member of parliament, not one, who doesn't sign on uh, to this kind of work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Farber, and, and thank you for your work with the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. It's uh, vitally important, and I appreciate your very clear and, and, uh, and sobering words about what is actually going on out there. Uh, now, uh, thanks to all of our speakers, we're going to go on to the question and answer uh, section. Uh, so you'll notice in the chat box that we have posted a Google form link and you can click uh, the link, you can submit your question there. Uh, we, because we have limited time, we only have uh, about uh, 15 minutes left. We'll do the best to answer the questions that we can. Uh, however, at the same time, if we're not uh, able to answer them, we'll do our best to follow up after this town hall. And uh, I see that we have the final result in terms of uh, the question that we asked you earlier. Have you personally experienced or have you witnessed incidences of hate directed towards people in your community, 76% uh, of you who answered have, have seen, witnessed firsthand or personally experienced incidences of hate. Uh, that again is a profoundly uh, sobering result. And so uh, we have questions coming in and uh, I'll start uh, with the, the first one. Uh, this is from Sally Davis from the Tantramar region. In, in New Brunswick, right on the Nova Scotia border. Thank you, Sally, for being, uh, being here tonight. Uh, and the question is, why are we stopping uh, with the swastikas? Why not the Confederate flag? Uh, and I'll answer that myself. Uh, first, uh, we're not referring to the Nazi emblem as the swastika. We are referring to it as the hooked cross and we'll be amending the legislation so that it, it says very clearly hooked cross. The swastika is a, is a very a sacred emblem. Uh, to, to uh, Hindus, to Jains, uh, to Buddhists in Canada. Uh, it was perverted, taken over by the Nazis. And part of the work that we're doing through the course of this legislation, Bill C-229, is to educate the public uh, to the difference between the Nazi perversion, the hooked cross, uh, and the profound religious symbol, which is the swastika. So we are not stopping with the Nazi hooked cross. We are including the Confederate flag uh, because of its, uh, its uh, ob obvious symbolism of, of violent racism and Ku Klux Klan uh, paraphernalia as well, the uniforms and the symbols of the Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan. As the Washington Post has noted, <clears throat> the Ku Klux Klan continues to be active. Uh, those are the uh, three uh, e emblems, uh, flags that are referenced clearly in the bill. And so uh, thank you for raising that, Sally. Uh, and it is absolutely true that many communities have seen the sale and uh, the display of the Confederate flag. And this is something that is uh, e equally uh, a sign of, of hatred, an emblem of hatred, a symbol of hate. Oh, well, thank you very much, Sally. Uh, we're, we'll now go to uh, Waterford, Ontario. This will be a more difficult question to answer. And uh, I would, uh, I'll ask uh, our panelists if they would like to uh, answer it, starting with uh, Dr. Perry. 
how can we prevent far right and hate groups from fundraising through online fundraisers such as Give, Send, Go and GoFundMe? In other words, how do we uh, stop the fundraising that is currently taking place uh, by far right groups and hate groups? Uh, Dr. Perry, would you like to take that one on? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that will become an increasingly difficult uh, question. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, far right groups morph and change, they change their names, they change their identities. And so sort of keeping up with them in terms of, um, you know, being able to uh, remove them from those sorts of platforms is going to be difficult, just as it has been on, uh, you know, on Facebook and, and some of the other kinds of social media platforms. Uh, because as, as I understand it, um, not sure about Give, Send, Go, but GoFundMe uh, does also have you know some community standards if you will and uh you know claim that they don't allow uh organizations who run counter to or entities that run counter to those uh, community standards uh, on the platform um so um i, I don't think give send go has the same uh, same kind of restrictions so i think that that's an important starting point but as we've seen with social media platforms the the willingness to enforce those um, those restrictions, um, are, 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 that willingness isn't always there. Um, and again, I, I think it is exacerbated by the fact that these groups are not easily identifiable. I mean, social media companies, you know, they have in-house expertise and, and out, out, you know, out of house expertise. They call on, I'm sure, you know, Bernie all the time, they call on me, uh, what's this group, Who, what did this, what's this mean? How do we define a hate group? That sort of thing. Um, I'm not sure that, you know, GoFundMe has that same kind of expertise or, or um, willingness or capacity to, uh, to reach out uh, for guidance on that. So that is, I think, maybe the next battle that we have in terms of online platforms and their support, in this case, financial support of, uh, of hate groups. If I could just add, uh, uh, one of the uh, panels that I'm now sitting on is a, a federal panel uh, of uh, uh, experts, so to speak, uh, looking at the whole issue of online harms um, to advise the government, uh, and I know, Peter, that you're, you're aware of this, uh, to advise the government on potential legislation for online harms. Uh, the issue of funding uh, agents uh, uh, has already you know, come up. It's going to obviously be, be a, a large part of this. Barbara is 100% correct here. Um, this is, they're a money-making thing. That, that's what they are. And they really don't care where they get their money from. But by the way, I might say that for you know some other social media giants as well. I mean, it, it, there has not been terrific um, insight and oversight of uh, of, a, of a number of uh, social media platforms. So we have our work cut out for us. I'm glad the legislation has been uh, the, the concept of the legislation has been put forward. Uh, I'm glad, at least as I said at the beginning, that we have uh, two parties that are uh, you know that are willing to to move on this. And I do have a hope that, that, that the others uh, you know, will, will join in as well once, once they take a look at some of the work that we have done here. So maybe, maybe we'll, we'll be moving forward. I'm, I'm hoping so. If I may, I think um, uh, processes are always necessary to, as smarter the government, wiser the population. The minute we bring up a new rule, the population figure out a new way to break the rule and to get onto that process to achieve their objectives. And uh, the online donation concept whereby money transfers so easily accomplished by e-transfers, I mean, we don't have to go to that public space. Somebody can go to their personal bank account and send money to an email address. So we have no way of really stopping that flow uh, as it stands today. If you do not go through GoFundMe, that's not necessarily a way. I could set up an uh, email and say, send the money to this email address and people can e-transfer money to me. So there's gotta be more regulations through the banking system and the media platforms that will help to give some kind of a review program and saying, once you start transferring money to a particular group, there's a time phase, maybe two weeks, one week, a month for approval of transfer of the funds. It has to be new policies and processes that will stop it because the system that is available today is so easy to bypass all the controls. So there needs to be advisory groups with CRA who are to look at this to advance, to advise financial institutions, to advise the media companies. The media companies are in business to make money. Let's not 
uh, avoid that concept. And you can't stop them from making money. And by using it, whether we use it for the right reason or the wrong reason, they're making their money and they'll find every way to keep going in business. So we, the population and the government need to devise methods. We need to set the proper committees in place to review and set strategies to help us control these, these free flow of funds to the, the, the groups we do not want to get money to promote hate. And thank you very much to, to all our panelists. And we'll move on uh, staying in Ontario at Jay Nair from Mississauga uh, writes uh, the following, and I'll, I'll start with, uh, with you, Pandit Sharma. Uh, can uh, the speakers talk about populism and how that is prompting hatred in Canada? Uh, so we'll start uh, with uh, Pandit Sharma. Well, actually, I'd like to do a little bit of history. Um, you know, the, the greatest uh, amount of hate was promoted initially in history by communities, by some community demanding that God belongs to them alone and taking total responsible ownership of God and saying the other group doesn't have God with them. And as such, they are either given a name and they are, they are put out of society because they belong to that other group. So this was perpetuated, if you go back to the age of colonialism, even back uh, the age of the all of the Spanish Inquisition and beyond that, we perpetuated these gross hate concepts of the, the, the residential schools, trying to change people's way of thinking all of these perpetuated these crimes. How can we change it? We need to we need to stop doing those things that were done so long. We're doing it quietly in, in a very subtle manner that whereby a group determines that God belongs to them alone and declares that if you belong not to that group, then you are not of a godly nature. And then as such, you are considered to be hated or disliked. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Farber. Well, populism, is, you know, has been around, uh, as, as Panda Charma said, for, for a very long time, but it's really taken root, I think, in the last, well, I'd say five years or, or so. And let, let's also be very direct and honest here. I mean, um, it has been spurred on and prodded by people in power. Uh, and that's why it's become kind of okay. So you had a guy like, you know, Donald Trump, who amazingly, surprisingly, incredibly uh, became president of the United States and uh, started embracing neo-Nazis and, and white supremacists. And these people then began to feel a, a certain credibility and legitimacy. QAnon, it's not a big surprise uh, that QAnon flourished uh, you know, under the, uh, under the Trump uh, presidency because he gave them permission to flourish. And uh, they, they have captured this entire um, uh, uh, you know, scene around misconceptions, disinformation, uh, conspiracy theories. You can basically say anything now uh, and people will, there will be enough people to believe it to kind of pour oil on, on the fire. And so we have to find ways. And I, listen, if I knew what those ways were, I'd write a book and make you know, a lot of money. I have no idea right now what those ways are. I'm, I'm actually quite frustrated. I used to have a full head of hair not all that many years ago. And I find myself today literally thinking, we haven't moved forward, we have actually moved backwards. And populism has been, again, one of the fuels that have been used by um, especially you know, the ultranationalists and others to, to, to drive their agenda. We've got to find a break and I'm not exactly sure yet where that break is. Yeah, yeah, Bernie, I think you're, I mean, you're absolutely right as, uh, you know, the right wing populism, particularly, right, does a phenomenal job. I mean, the far right uh, excels at exploiting popular grievances and popular concerns and weaving them into their, their own narratives. And we've certainly seen this, yeah, absolutely with Trump. We've seen it in our own context with political narratives, especially those that um, you know, sort of vilify communities, vilify a corrupt government, the tyrannical government, as we heard so much about during the, the convoys. Uh, but I, th I think the main thing is to is that the variant that we're seeing right now, um, you know, searches for scapegoats and presents scapegoats uh, to ready, ready and willing listeners uh, so that it does exacerbate um, xenophobia it does exacerbate hostility and grievances against particular communities who are created as threats 
uh, whether it's to our cultural well-being or physical well-being uh, or our economic well-being. And uh, again, that's been exploited incredibly well by uh, far-right politicians and, and far-right uh, extremist groups as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we have enough time, I think, for just a couple more questions. We're going to move to Coquitlam, BC and uh, Jerry Watson, who asks the following. Uh, COVID seems to have fueled uh, a lot of hostilities as we've seen in the media. Should we expect to see a reduction in instances of hate in these various far forms as the pandemic uh, hopefully uh, will be fizzling out? And I'll, I'll start with you, Dr. Perry. Short answer is probably not, uh, and I think that I think that the the convoy, uh, you know, for all of its immediate dangers, also has a long term risk associated with it. Um, you know, I think that many of those in the far right that were associated with the convoy see it as a win for them. They were able to mobilize thousands of people in Ottawa, you know, maybe hundreds of people at different uh, border crossings, but thousands of people on the sides of the streets as they went across the the country. Uh, they see that as a win. They see the fact that others are, are now parroting their narratives uh, as a success. So they've learned that they have the capacity to mobilize hate, to mobilize anx the anxieties I just referred to. So I think that that is going to continue. I'm also not convinced that we're not going to go back to mandates of some sort. And that is just going to uh, create, I think, uh, an explosion again. And then we've got to look at other things that are happening. You know, we've got provincial um, elections coming up in uh, in a couple of provinces. We've got the the American midterms. We've already talked about the Trump effect. We know the American politics affect us. We've got med midterm elections coming up that are, uh, you know, the narratives are going to be ratcheted up there. Um, they're going to be very divisive. Trump is going to be stumping uh, for his minions along the way. So, uh, you know, we're we're not we're not done. Um, and, and you know, sort of, uh, I think the COVID conspiracy theories will continue to circulate uh you know trump narratives will continue to circulate i think you know we're in this for uh for the long haul i was saying i said the same thing earlier today and i said usually i'm an optimist but not not in this context i'm afraid and and let us not forget uh, how did the COVID-19 conspiracy theories played into the whole issue around neo-Nazism and white supremacy, how these people who were so sure that COVID didn't exist despite the proof in front of them wore yellow stars of David as, as symbolically becoming victims of, of, of the government. What is the yellow star of David? The yellow star of David was in fact a force, a force symbol to be worn by Jews during the time of the Holocaust so that they can be identified, so that they can be gathered, so that they can be thrown into freight cars, so that they can be taken to uh, death camps, thrown into gas chambers, men, women, and children, and gassed to death. This is the symbol that they used as a means by which to try and I uh, identify as victims. And in fact, they were not victims at all. The last thing I want to say, and I think this is really important. Uh, many of you know that I'm not a cheerleader for the social media platforms, obviously. These are big businesses. But I also want to give, I also want us to be realistic. Um, I believe that they do want to make changes. I think like us, they are all human beings and they see what, you know, what they are. They are really, what are they? A reflection of society. They are a reflection of who we are. And I don't think they are bad people. I think that if we are able to present a working plan, a workable plan, my hope is that they will get on board uh, this train and move with us because without their cooperation, we're going to, I really think we're not going to have um, uh, much good fortune. We need everybody's cooperation. And my hope is that whether it's Google or whether it's Facebook or, 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 or Twitter, my hope is that they do come on board. It's a slow process, but here, Barb, I'm going to try to be an optimist because I, I, we have no place else to go. I, I think we all have to be wary of something that, as you mentioned, that elections are coming and all of the political uh, ranting and raving that's going to go on. Politicians tend to, and it's only in their best benefit, to use whatever tools at their disposal, whatever groups is at their disposal, to promote their own agenda. And if they can win those groups over and they can make noises, they will use them. We have to caution our politicians to not to become victims of these groups. I mean, even when we had the situation in Ottawa, 
politicians were out there walking with those people and shaking hands. Some of them did for the right reasons, some of them did for not so right reasons. So I think we need to be cautious and ca caution our politicians not to allow these people to, to be, become part of their, their forum and then they take advantage of them and then these people said, I've got a keyhole or a foothold with this group and use that as an advantage point to promote their hate. We must caution them at all times on this matter. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, we only have about a minute left. I, I see uh, um, as, as we click up to, uh, to the hour. Uh, a final question I'll, I'll take myself. Uh, this is uh, Jonathan from Hamilton Centre in Ontario. Uh, and uh, Jonathan asks, will the NDP Liberal Agreement help pass Bill C-229? I would like to see this passed. Uh, we, we all would, Jonathan, thanks so much. And uh, what's remarkable about the bill so far is that we really have received support from all, uh, all corners of this minority parliament. Uh, so members of parliament from all parties have expressed uh, support for the bill. Uh, that gives me some hope that uh, we may find uh, that we can expedite the passage of the bill in the coming months. We'll have to see. But uh, I will say this, that each one of you that is on tonight can make a difference because we're at this critical period in the legislative process. Uh, it will be a very important to have uh, members of parliament on board. So here's how you can help us. You can write to your MP today. You'll see in the chat box a link on my uh, campaign page. Uh, this is on my website, peterjulian.ca. You can put your postal code down and an email will be sent automatically to your member of parliament uh, saying, asking them to support Bill C-229. We, we also ask you to take a selfie of yourself holding up an anti-hate uh, rally sign and post it on your Twitter or Facebook page and make sure that you hashtag uh, disarm hate, uh, hashtag disarm hate, hashtag C229. And you can also tag me at uh, MP Julian. That's uh, at MP J U L I A N. Uh, these are ways that you can help in the campaign to, uh, to push forward on Bill C229. Have a lot of uh, thanks to do just to, to wrap up. Thank, uh, thank our speakers, Pandit Sharma, Dr. Barbara Perry, Bernie Barber, and uh, Jugbeet Singh, our national leader, who's here with his daughter. You can see. Uh, would you like to say a few words to, to wrap up, Jugmeet? Sure. I just want to say a huge thank you, uh, Peter, for organizing this, to all the organizers on our team, to all the attendees, to our amazing, amazing panelists. We heard a lot of really uh, amazing ideas, exciting ideas. And, and serious approaches to this serious problem of, of hate. And I just am really uh, inspired by the fact that there's so many people who care about doing something about it. So thank you all, really thankful. And my daughter says hi and thank you as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Jagmeet. And I too would like to thank the technical team, uh, Doris and David and Tanya, Aladi and Ravina, great, a great team that uh, flawless technically, despite my, um, I'm uh, all thumbs when it comes to technology. So thank you very much uh, to our technical team. And a final thank you to all of you for staying uh, at this important juncture for uh, an hour of, uh, of, uh, of discussion and on pushing back against hate in all of its forms. Uh, you've shown how important this is, this is for Canadians to stand up and speak out against hate in all of its forms. We wish you all the best. Uh, through, through the remainder of COVID that hopefully will not be too much longer. Thank you very much and good night and thanks for joining us this evening.